Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and hopefully your lunches will be arriving shortly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure everyone's hungry after a busy morning. Um, my name is Christine Kendrick from the City of Portland Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, and today I'm going to be moderating the panel. Each panelist will introduce themselves before talking about how, some, how they center equity in their work. We've got representatives from City of Portland and also Verde. So, let me first. There we go. <laughs> I was avoiding the very obvious largest green button on here. <laughs> So I, I'm going to start off with just a brief introduction about what we mean when we say equity. And we define equity as uh, being achieved when one's identity cannot predict the outcome. So in the city of Portland, if we are working towards making equity real, that means that all Portlanders have access to high quality education, living wage jobs, safe neighborhoods, basic services, green spaces and parks, efficient public transportation, healthy natural environment, uh, decent housing, and also healthy food. Equity also means that all Portlanders, and if equity was real, all Portlanders and communities are fully participating and influencing in public decision making. And this equity and these ideas are so important because we know that that's not really the case right now. We don't see that um, conditions here in Portland. And we know that because of really great work and research done by organizations like the Coalition of Communities of Color, Urban League, and Portland State University researchers. They've produced really great work showing us we have quantifiable or an, an, uh, qualifying, uh, sorry, quantitative and qualitative data showing strong evidence of institutional and community-specific disparities. So we need to work really hard and change our ways to actually make this real. And if we think about it, if you were doing a connectivity or Wi-Fi project, Equity doesn't mean just putting devices in a neighborhood different than where your project's focused. We need, really need to take the time to think about, is that what the community has identified their needs are? Do they need additional services and tools to actually create that access? So we really need to be much more comprehensive in how we think about equity. So next, I'll just kind of review what we, the differences between equality and equity that we see here. So on the left-hand side, we're showing an example of equality or equal support. So this is the belief that everyone will benefit from the same support, but if you see here, not everyone's starting off at the same point. So everyone has the same block to stand on, but some people have a shorter fence and a hill, and some people have a taller fence and are starting at a lower elevation. So when we think about equity, we are actually making sure that each group has a targeted support that's specific to their needs. Um, so that they can actually overcome the barriers that are there, and then everyone can see the game. And when we make sure that we center equity and we change our ways and make really comprehensive effort to incorporate equity, equity into our work, we are trying to strive towards uh, removal of those sy systemic barriers so everyone can see the game, nobody needs that different support. Don't get too excited. This is not a live shot from the Orion Spain game right now. So I'm glad to see that lunch has arrived. Um, and I'm excited to hear from our panelists. So we'll move in. And I think Janine Gates, you'll start off. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Janine Gates. And I am with Commissioner Amanda Fritz. So our smart cities uh, work is leading with equity and tailoring equity to data, information, and technology. Our goal is to address inequities and disparities using data and investing in technology-driven projects that improve people's lives. Agreed. We will engage underserved and underrepresented populations, design data collection to uncover and learn about the barriers that create inequities and disparities and to create solutions using data to understand how solutions benefit and further burden underserved communities. It's important that we also protect individuals' privacy. We must invest in these data-driven solutions. 
underserved and underrepresented, focusing on communities of color and communities with disabilities, which aligns with our Office of Equity and Human Rights, which is tasked with guiding and creating an equitable city. When we design policies, programs, and practices that center solutions that work for the most vulnerable communities, which will benefit all of us. To receive our support, you must focus on equity, acknowledge one size does not fit all, solve a problem and define who may be burdened and who benefits. Use data from or about underserved communities in every phase of the project or plan. Ensure community colors are at the decision-making tables. Identify success that was developed based on input from underserved communities. Establish a culture for ongoing engagement and involvement by underserved communities, values, diversity of backgrounds, and needs. Provide detailed information about how data is being used and how privacy is being protected. Support a smart city PDX focus area. Understand the importance of transparency and have an open mind. Our focus areas are economic prosperity, human health, transportation slash mobility, housing, public safety, environmental health, education, resiliency. Our focus areas are bringing several city plans together with the goal of ensuring equity is at the forefront. So I'm Julio Melchuk, and I work in the City of Portland's Office for Community Technology. I also was on the equity work group of the Smart City Steering Committee within the City of Portland, um, involved in developing the priorities framework that we're um, talking about here today. So Janine and Christine um, talked about why we developed the framework and what the city has committed to. And I'm going to talk about how we're going to do that. The priorities framework is a method for the city to make decisions about resources in smart cities projects and policies and partnerships. Um, when we talk about city resources, we're really talking about city staff time, um, funds, city expertise, city assets or infrastructure, and public policy or partnership support. The framework includes eight first-order design principles for city staff to, get, to gauge whether to pursue a smart city's project or partnership. We believe these design principles are just as important as other first-order design principles such as security, privacy, and many of the things that, other things that were discussed in the morning sessions. For example, one of our framework principles is establish tools and techniques that allow for ongoing iterative engagement and evaluation by underserved communities. So in other words, for the city to move forward on a smart city project, the project mu design must include iterative evaluation that involves the target community in that process. We envision using these principles to vet multiple opportunities that compete for city resources. They also focus our decision making about allocation of limited resources on our values of equity and community driven solutions. The framework provides a clear point for city staff, but also for community nonprofits, the private sector, and or academia who would like to engage smart city projects with city support. The framework design principles provide a way for us to get to yes, but also a, way, a basis for us to say no. Another principle is support of a smart city PDX focus area. As Christine mentioned, in developing the framework, we culled through most of the city's existing plans to identify areas common throughout those plans. 
This is a way to tether smart city projects and policies to extensive community processes that went into developing the existing citywide plans. Some of these plans were talked about in the first morning session um, by our lead city planner. Um, the 2030 uh, comprehensive plan, uh, the city also has a broadband strategic plan, the climate action plan, and others. Much of the work currently underway in the city is about transportation and mobility. But we wanted to make connections between existing city plans, areas of focus, and potential smart city projects to help our multiple bureaus better understand how city, smart city innovations, use of data, and technology could apply to their efforts. It will also help us leverage community identified needs of other plans in our smart cities work. So what's next for us? Um, the Portland City Council is scheduled to vote on the uh, priorities framework tomorrow at 3.30 at our city hall if any of you are interested in coming down and supporting us. Um, if adopted, the uh, framework creates a citywide coordinated approach for us to decide if and how we might engage in this work. But of course, adopting the framework is just the first step and actually probably the easiest step. Um, now we need to walk the talk. We're in the process of working with community partners to figure out how to creatively engage target communities in implementing the framework and gauging success. And we also have existing smart city PDX projects, so we'll need to integrate the framework midstream into these projects to further impact and future investments. Thank you. All right. Um, my name is Hector Dominguez. I'm the Open Data Coordinator for the Smart Cities program. Um, first of all, I think it's um, very important for me right now to mention that all the work that I'm currently doing has been like has a long history. That actually, this very event closes a loop for me. A uh, long time ago, I was doing a summer internship at NIST, uh, and I got to learn about all these ideas from, from James Albus, and he planted some, this, the structure for what intelligent systems were back then. And uh, I'd be happy to, uh, that all, many of those ideas are actually be able to, to work around that, implementing those in the current work here in Portland. So, uh, data is always something around, around uh, building, really, a, a human story of what that means. So that's what I'm going to try to represent here. And I'm going to do it through a, an, a storytelling approach where uh, I'm going to split it in some chapters. That, so the first chapter is when suddenly we have this very shiny technology coming into the uh, city of Portland. Uh, that is going to transform the world. Uh, this shiny technology is offering so many features. Uh, the cutting edge uh, hardware, software, that is going to change the way the transportation is actually happening, right? It's something that is coming from the best minds uh, from all over the world. However, Chapter two is about the Mayan game happening. So you can see there, there is a, a map of how Portland has evolved. Uh, if you see the clear uh, gray area is uh, Portland uh, in 18, uh, I don't say that. It's in 1851, right? The original Portland town. Uh, it grew, uh, by 1891, just got the, the regular boundaries for what the, the town of Portland, the city of Portland was back then. However, there is this uh, in-between uh, red area defined there between the city of Portland and the city of Gresham that was annexed 
in, in 1981, uh, right? So that's new. After 1981, all that uh, became part of Portland. It was very, very underdeveloped, basically farmland. And then new residents started coming in, uh, mostly uh, people who were long income or people who were displaced because they, there is a long history here about red, uh, redlining and how mostly African-American communities have been displaced from uh, north side of Portland to the numbers where uh, those streets that they started in 82nd, 110, 115, 150 uh, avenue or streets, right? So on those neighborhoods, one night, there is this elderly uh, Chinese man who was just a Sunday night uh, playing Mayan with his friends. He was, at, after that, he was trying to cross the street on uh, 115th uh, Street, and then he rolled over, uh, got basically in a traffic accident with a car. He lost his life uh, that night. Very related and very close to me was another accident also happening in the same corridor uh, on Division on uh, 87th which uh, another man from uh, immigrant from Myanmar, he was just finishing uh, his job as a dishwasher in one of the Chinese restaurants uh, in, in that neighborhood. And uh, where I live, where I just moved actually, and um, he finished, that night it was very cold, very dark, and also he had a car accident, it was uh, icy that night actually, winter night, and he lost his life. And it gets very close because only one hour before that, my wife and my one-year-old back then, he was just crossing the same intersection where uh, that accident happened. And I just learned that, actually, when I was just showing to her these this, uh, slides. She said, oh, yeah, we were just one hour before. Said, wow. So, okay. Now we have uh, all this shiny technology uh, and all these different accidents, right? And then there's something around the city of Portland, uh, very, uh, people who, who had been working with communities, they have a good idea of what, what's happening there, about all those accidents, and there is uh, this something called Vision Zero. Okay, so they were already working on, on redesigning those uh, streets and avenues that actually are very wide. Uh, they were designed for being intercity connections, so uh, they were uh, really fast. And they started doing a project with that. They, they involved some community members. And then is where the things start happening really interesting, where the biker community starts coming in and say, oh, those are actually uh, uh, some screenshots from the biker community. I went to some of those sessions and saying, yeah, of course, the cars go really fast. And, uh, and we, we just feel it, right? Um, the, we want the cars to be just in the central lanes and uh, we're gonna be happy. Just des design everything to be uh, single use for bikers uh, at, on the two edges. Okay, but then the local businesses started coming in and say, nope, we cannot do that because then our, our cargo uh, trucks cannot be uh, there. And then residents started complaining that, no, we cannot do that because uh, we actually want to turn uh, left, right on this intersection, so there is a conflict there. So there are some, I uh, started thinking, okay, well, we can use this very shiny technology to help us to understand what's happening, how the, all these dynamics uh, start interacting to each other and, and try to see if the changes that our planners are actually proposing are going to be uh, working and what's the positive or negative effect, right? So as, the, as a city, we are working with uh, the, Department of, uh, the Bureau of Transportation Department of Planning and Sustainability uh, to deploy those sensors and then get a better understanding. And those are actually pictures of uh, the installation of those uh, uh, CDIQ sensors, which is a partnership with uh, GE, AT&T, and Intel, and the city of Portland, who actually own those sensors. And you see that there is a there is bug. Uh, there is a beetle car on top of a roof there in the middle of, the, of nowhere. Why? I don't know. But that's part of what gives our neighborhood this uh, personality that we like. 
And then we, at the end, with all this information, we really want to build the human story behind that. What the sensors and the information that we get from the sensors tell us about how we move on our, our streets, really. So we are planning to get pedestrian information. Uh, we are trying to get vehicles counts and dynamics through, through all that. We are trying to get uh, bike detections as well. The before the changes that are planned for those avenues happen and the after. So we can evaluate uh, with information and with technology if those changes are actually working and we can actually plan better in the future. So we really, really want to use technology and information and data to build and, and, and construct all these human histories, uh, stories behind. There are multiple and there have many, many faces and they speak also many, many languages. And it's a story that we are still writing. Hi, my, my name is Carolina Iraita Gonzalez, and I'm the community energy advocate with VEDVE. Um, I wanted to thank the City of Portland Bureau of Planning and Sustainability for inviting me here today to tell you more about the Living Cully Community Energy Plan. So the Living Cully Community Energy Plan is a neighborhood scale energy plan that identifies energy conservation and energy generation pilots with a strong anti-displacement focus. Uh, but before I go um, into the plan, I want to tell you more about the Cully neighborhood where the plan is based um, and the Living Cully Collaborative. So the Cully neighborhood is located in Northeast Portland it has about 13,000 residents, and it's considered one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the state of Oregon. It's home to many uh, refugee and immigrant families. About 17% of residents are below the federal poverty line, and we have a pretty even uh, split of homeowners and renters. There are also six mobile home parks in the neighborhood, and about 10% of all Cully residents live in a manufactured home or an RV. So as you can see, the Cully neighborhood is a pretty diverse neighborhood. Um, it has a high low income population and it's also a neighborhood where community members are really engaged and interested in identifying solutions to community problems. So as many of you may know, Portland is considered a model city when it comes to sustainability initiatives and environmental initiatives. Unfortunately, those sustainability initiatives and environmental um, projects don't benefit all neighborhoods in an equitable manner. And Cully is one of those neighborhoods that traditionally has been left out of receiving those benefits. So in 2010, four nonprofits that were operating in the Cully neighborhood um, Verde, Hacienda CDC, the Native American Youth and Family Center, and Habitat for Humanity decided to come together to identify a new model for sustainability. The Living Cully Partners believe that sustainability can be reinterpreted as an anti-poverty strategy. That means that the four nonprofits leverage their resources to build sustainability and environmental infrastructures within the neighborhood that also address the community's needs um, in employment, in education, in health, in housing, and other disparities that community members might be facing. The Living Cully Community Energy Plan is our, um, our attempt to adopt our theory of change, sustainability as an anti-poverty strategy, and apply it to the energy sector. The Living Cully Energy Plan creates a blueprint for how we can address environmental and affordability issues through energy conservation programs and energy investments in the Cully neighborhood. Our vision of success is that in the next 10 years, energy investments in Cully will have helped low-income residents stay in the neighborhood, Cully residents are empowered and lead community, energy, and anti-displacement efforts. Youth have access to energy-related STEM education. 
local businesses and social enterprises install the neighborhood's growing energy infrastructure, Cully is an energy resilient neighborhood, and our energy initiatives support other community-based organizations and policy making at multiple levels. Um, this vision really speaks to me because I can clearly see how investments in energy technology will lead to positive outcomes for Cully residents. Um, I also wanted to point out that the vision has a strong alignment uh, with housing affordability, and so we wanted to make sure that our energy investments helped low-income folks stay in the neighborhood and that it aligned with our anti-displacement um, efforts. And so, as I mentioned before, about half of all Cully residents are renters. Um, and over the last five years, our community has began to see uh, eviction notices being passed out. You know, we're seeing houses and, and apartment complexes being redeveloped for higher profits. And so community members are very concerned about being able to stay in the neighborhood and being able to afford their homes. In fact, community members are so concerned that during the past three years, they meet monthly just to talk about housing affordability and how they can support, um, support each other in staying in the neighborhood. And this photo is actually from a, um, a demonstration that community members organized in the Cully neighborhood when an apartment complex um, gave a 100% gave a rent increase with a 90-day notice to low-income families. Um, and so commu community members organized to um, support the families that were being evicted from their homes. So as we began to conduct research on potential energy investments, we knew that it was critical for the energy plan to align with the community's anti-displacement strategies. And one of our main criteria for any pilot that we identified for the energy plan is that it had to support at least one of the following anti-displacement strategies. One, acquire and set aside land for market shielded housing development. Preserve existing housing for protected affordability. Provide direct assistance and information to lower home utility costs and maintenance costs. Provide assistance to priority population small business owners and other institutions serving low income communities. By aligning our energy pilots with these anti-displacement strategies, we were one, putting the community's concerns first and actually showing that we were listening to what the community um, was asking for. And second, striving towards energy investments that would serve all community residents without increasing rent or um, causing low-income residents to uh, increase their debts in order to participate in the energy sector. So here are the selected pilots that we identified for the energy plan. We have four pilots for 2018 and um, two pilots for next year. The first pilot is a ductless heat pump co-op. So ductless heat pumps are um, heating and cooling un units that can save, and, um, save people on energy bills about 25 to 50%. Um, and they tend to range between $3,000 and $5,000. So they're not super expensive, but they're still out of um, reach for a lot of our low-income households. So we want to create a deckless heat pump co-op where we organize households to aggregate their um, purchasing power so that we can bring down the cost of the deckless heat pump. We're also actively looking for grants and other uh, funding mechanisms so we can continue to bring down the cost of the deckless heat pump. Because the last thing we want to do is have um, low-income households take on more debt in order to decrease their electricity bills. The next project that we identified was um, solar photovoltaic installation and battery storage at St. Charles Church. So St. Charles Church is a community institution in the neighborhood. It supports a lot of the community organizing that happens in the neighborhood. Um, it also houses a soup kitchen and provides uh, energy and rent um, assistance to people that are in need. And so um, by installing a solar array and battery storage on top of the church, 
we hope to cut down on the operating cost that the church has to um, take on, and uh, that way will the church will have more of their um, more of their money that they can actually put into other community services, and the battery storage on. Uh, with the battery storage, which is included on this project, would create the first uh, energy resilient building in the neighborhood. So if there was ever a disaster, um, this would be one of the central places that could support community. The next pilot that we identified was um, solar photovoltaic installation on the Oak Leaf Mobile Home Park. So uh, like I said, we have six mobile home parks in the neighborhood. They're very vulnerable to displacement, and so we're really interested in identifying different um, funding mechanisms and policies that can support um, mobile home residents, uh, either through uh, energy generation or energy efficiency. And then, of course, we have a community energy education campaign um, because we want to continue to provide uh, educational opportunities for people in the neighborhood. So we're currently developing a solar curriculum uh, for youth that, we're, that we will be implementing this year. And we're partnering with another nonprofit, the Community Energy Project, to um, teach community residents how to lead weatherization workshops so they can lead weatherization workshops in the neighborhood. Our two pilots for next year um, is the redevelopment of the, of the Living Kali Plaza, which will provide an additional 130 um, affordable housing units in the neighborhood. And so we're currently doing the research to identify the green features that will go with that building. Um, that will, they'll probably include solar um, and some type of electric vehicle infrastructure that serves primarily the low-income residents that will be living in the, um, in the new housing, in the new housing. And the last project that we're looking um, for is a, uh, a Cully-based community solar project that, prim that primarily serves low-income residents. I wanted to end by saying that um, nationally there are many low-income communities and communities of color like Cully. And historically, many of these communities are marginalized and divested from. So as the tech industry continues to innovate and we see new possibilities at hand's reach, will we continue to leave low-income communities and communities of color out of the benefits, or will we finally shift and center community needs amidst emerging technologies? And if we do make the decision to invest in marginalized communities, the question rapidly transitions to, will current residents be able to stay in the neighborhood as it improves? The Living Kali Community Energy Plan envisions a community that benefits from the emerging energy sector. Not just access to participating with these new technologies, but also benefiting from the ownership opportunities, the wealth building opportunities, the health, education, and job opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. It was really exciting to have you share really a community-driven and a community-led project and plan that only can consider and know what the issues are going on in that neighborhood. So I wanted to start off our questions with thinking about this idea to actually address equity and integrate it into whether it's organizations, local governments, or maybe even a company. You really have to have partnerships with the members of your community or the members of your market. Can you uh, share with us suggestions about how to actually build those partnerships and not repeat community engagement processes, mistakes from the past, or really cre avoid creating transactional one-way inter interactions? Yeah, um, I've been thinking about this a lot just because we um, are thinking about how to move away from what we call like transactional partnerships where it's kind of like one off or it's like there isn't any real alignment to what we want to do um, when we meet up with ag government agencies or um, private companies to more of a strategic partnership. Um, so I think like, when I talk with government agencies or private institutions or universities, um, my recommendations are one, really to internally organize around best practices for community engagement. 
um, because it's it's always surprising to me like you know one government department um, might have three different staff that are working on three different projects contacting us and trying to get us to be you know part of their projects like participate on committees um, provide presentations come to these meetings and so sometimes there's just a lack of organization internally on how to work with community partners and community organizations um, and it can be very taxing on um, our nonprofits to be receiving so many requests. Um, with that note, we don't really get funded to sit on committees. <laughs> and so, you know, a lot of grants want you to do the work. And so um, there is quite a few requests to provide information, um, to be like the, the bridge between the community members um, and what private institutions, universities, government agencies are doing. And so we've moved more and more into asking these institutions to fund our participation. So if we're going to be doing presentations or sitting on a monthly committee for the next two years, we ask that these agencies find the funds um, so that we can actually resource our time. And, and then the third part that I think moves us into more strategic partnerships um, is an actual align alignment between what our nonprofits are trying to do um, and what you know, government agencies, private institutions, and universities are trying to do. So that it's not this transactional relationship, but it becomes a more strategic relationship where we're both meeting the needs and, um, and the outcomes that we're looking for. Thanks. I think that transitions to another question I had for, for Julie, kind of thinking about, could, could you elaborate and share how you think the work that we're trying to do with the Smart City PDX Priorities Framework will help us implement those strategies, have better alignment and strategic organization before we work with communities that is different than previous city projects or plans? So, yeah, I'd like to um, answer that, but I also think that that's a challenge for this room and I think, you know, city governments um, have, as Carolina said, um, you know, struggled with how to engage underserved communities in um, making decisions about uh, resource allocation. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the technology um, could help uh, us better engage underserved communities, but we need this community in the room to be helping us determine how technology can, can do that with us. Um, so I know that there's the, the super clusters around you know, transportation and security and privacy and all those kinds of things. Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges for cities is around this community engagement piece and how to do it in a way that is authentic uh, moving forward, but also how to do it in a way that we can, we can fund it within um, limited city resources. So I would put that as a little challenge out to this room around that. Um, but to go to the question how we think the priorities framework will help um, the city implement strategies, um, you know, the smart city work is, even though we have some projects that are moving forward now, at least the city of Portland is, has just began, begun to organize um, a citywide framework for um, deciding how to allocate resources. So. Um, this framework that is, um, you know, kind of holds equity at its core um, will really help us, I think, identify um, up front whether or not the city wants to re invest our resources in a project or a partnership um, because, you know, we, we get, as, as you may know, um, a lot of offers of, you know, through vendors or academia, um, other folks to, to engage in smart cities work um, for, 
for various purposes. And what we're trying to do as a city to, is to say, those are really good projects, but in order for us to spend our limited resources on, um, on the project, we need to be ensuring that you know, the, the communities that, you're, that we're trying to serve are being not just considered, but as a core design principle in the project. Um, so we're hoping, as this rolls out citywide, that we're going to be able to use the framework to kind of hold ourselves accountable to those equity um, principles and to community-driven solutions. So I think while we're talking about the priorities framework, I'll, I'd like to, to ask Janine a question. How, I know we're, we're, we're going to city council tomorrow to, to present this to Portland City Council, but how would you explain or tell some, share a little bit of backstory about how we currently have elected officials, bureau directors, and staff from so many bureaus to support this? What was that process like? I think the process was maybe easier than other plans with the initiatives that the city has uh, participated in. And I think part of that was because we're really trying to focus on equity and we have equity uh, managers in almost every bureau, if not every bureau. And so we had our Office of Equity and Human Rights at the table from the beginning. And they meet with our elected officials and meet as bureau directors, um, equity managers. And so there was always a conversation about smart cities, but I don't think we named it then, around housing, transportation, how do we get smarter, what, what we're doing, how do we include individuals, how we don't lose certain people. And so that conversation was happening quite a bit. And then um, I think when we start ha hearing smart cities and those that are not involved in this technology world, it's like, what are you talking about? And I remember when I first got involved in our smart cities uh, committee, I was like, I don't even understand this. Like, the internet can't clearly explain what smart cities is. So what are we doing? And we met, um, I met with our planning and sustainability individuals about what we're trying to do. And once I had an understanding of that and we start meeting with other city players and discussing that, it was so clear. And it was something that we knew we needed to do or we were gonna further displace people, we are gonna build this technology system or this transportation system, but how do we ensure that it serves our communities that are further out? We're gonna do housing, we have this housing technology system coming, but how do we serve the public? And I just felt like our commissioners and mayor really wanted that. And I remember meeting with uh, Commissioner Fritz, who I work with, and saying, this is why we're doing A, B, C, and D. And just made it clear it was easy for our city to get on board. And it, I feel like everyone's really excited about how do we serve those that are most burdened by systems that we already created. How can we ensure that this policy moves us forward? And it's easy when it's a city-wide initiative, so we're all can communicate and we're all on the same, we're all on the same page. And I think that's very new for us. It is exciting. I, I, I want Hector to start off the answer to this question, but I think everybody else, if you have other ideas, please um, chime in and add to it. But um, thinking about that we, we need to lead with the, the, the human story, I think also, uh, Carolina, your last slide mentioned this, how do we make sure that the community needs are the center of emerging technologies. So um, Hector, what recommendations would you make to another city, a community, or a company so that you're making sure your solution development is focused on that human story first and not leading with the technology? Um, I think something really important is to see uh, all these different stakeholders uh, beyond what this simple subject could be, but rather uh, like getting all these different um, people around and communities a more active participation. I, um, civic engagement is, is, a, is a difficult thing to do. E equity is a difficult thing, thing to do. Uh, we are still internally in the city. We are defining what equity means. We are, we are working really hard on defining those metrics. So, so we have a guideline on that. So that's actually uh, high in our priority list. 
Uh, but imagine, uh, the, well, you have seen Portland. Portland has the reputation of being the widest city in, in the US. You haven't been in East Portland. <laughs> because we have uh, so many languages uh, just in my neighborhood. We speak uh, Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, Korean, Spanish, Somali, uh, uh, Burmese, uh, Lao, uh, Thai, uh, in my Arabic. Armenian, Russian, so it's really, really diverse communities. All those families, all of them, they have children in, their, in our schools, right? Serving all those communities really represent a big challenge for a city if we are still using a monolithic approach, right? That's where technology and this emerging technology, I believe, represents a huge step up if we can use it uh, in a human way. If we can use it in a way that uh, it can empower communities rather than just uh, use it, our information or our data as a simple uh, modeling subject. But uh, in a way, uh, we also looking into how to engage uh, those different groups uh, and participate in defining uh, how we are going to use uh, this emerging technology, right? As a, as a vendor uh, or as a collaborator, we have a uh, community's uh, um, priorities framework for you to see what are, uh, where is the city going to invest resources, right? Now, uh, this, oh, there are all these technology that comes uh, very handy, like artificial intelligence, for instance, and we all, uh, mostly understand what uh, the, all these internal biases uh, mean or represent for many families and many uh, different population groups. They might actually represent things about life and death when somebody goes to a hospital and cannot really uh, say what uh, it hurts when somebody is applying for a mortgage and they don't get uh, the, the right answer, right? Because uh, in artificial intelligence uh, algorithm is actually segmenting uh, the, the information for that individual in a, in a, with a bad score, just because of bias, perhaps, right? Or um, anyway, so having also developers involved in, uh, in working on the next generation of technology is really important. Uh, there is uh, like this initiative around uh, the, how we can work with the local startups where uh, founders and owners are actually people of color, right? How we can uh, start going and promoting incubators, specifically targeting people of color, for instance. The city of Portland is blessed with a very uh, magnificent creative community, makers and uh, designers, dreamers, all over the city, right? Uh, not all of them have access to uh, resources and information, and, and their input can be very valuable as well. So it's a big challenge, but uh, that's why we are here, because we want you to understand that there is so much potential uh, if we include all of, the, all of them, uh, if you include us, basically. Anyone, ideas? How do you make sure technology is focused on human story first, not the technology? I think the only thing I would add, you said some great things, would be to meet people where they are. And I think that's what we're doing really well. Like for someone that does not have a technology background, never thought I would work in technology or be involved, you all met me where I was. And I think that's very, and I got on it and I was like, oh yeah, I like it. Now I want to be more involved. And I think that's very important. In order to affect change, we have to meet individuals where, we, where they are and then try to move forward together because they will also be more invested in what you're working on. So I, I, I wanted to ask about, um, again, how well we do, and we think we've now designed a solution or implemented a solution that's focused on that human story, but we need to go back and understand, um, did we actually reach that community benefit? Did we create other unintended burdens? And this requires a lot of evaluation. So I'm wondering, maybe Carolina, do you have any um, examples from the Living Coley Energy Plan where you really are making sure you're incorporating that evaluation up front or how to have the resources to do evaluation or other examples? And anyone else also? Mm -hmm. um, let me think. Um, I mean, 
I wish I could say that we did have something in place to evaluate the energy plan. Um, I do think evaluation is really important um, and data is really important. Um, you know, we, I will say that like when we were doing the energy plan, we relied, um, we had some like really ambitious goals as far as data evaluation for the neighborhood in regards to um, energy. So we wanted to identify uh, energy generation for the neighborhood, um, uh, you know, how much energy consumption was currently happening. And um, it, was, it was a challenge, obviously, trying to get energy data um, just because of the privacy laws that exist around, um, you know, customers' privacy laws around how much energy they're using. And I will say, though, that during that whole period of investigating um, the energy data sets that we had for the Cully neighborhood, uh, something that we missed out to and then came back in the end is the qualitative data component. So it's really easy to just fixate on the quantitative, so like the numbers piece um, and what's that telling you. And if you then do the qualitative data, um, like actually talking to people and getting their stories and experiences, you might find out something completely different. Um, and the example where we saw that as evident was around energy burden. So we were able to calculate energy burden um, for the city of Portland, low-income households, and um, Cully residents using the American Community Survey data. But then once we started doing um, individual surveys and interviews with community members, we found that the energy burden of our low-income residents was much higher than what the actual data sets um, were, were telling us. And so I think when it comes to evaluation, just um, how essential it is to not just rely on the numbers, but get in there and actually speak to people who are living those experiences. I think a big component of you know effective evaluation um, is, if for me anyway, is that evaluation um, needs to be about learning, um, for one thing. It needs to be iterative, um, and that is, I think, Carolina just talked about an iterative evaluation process where you have desired outcomes, but as the project moves forward, you learn about other things that um, might be issues that you can address or need to address, and that you're agile in that way in your evaluation to, um, to pivot in those areas. Um, the other thing that government isn't, isn't really good at um, and I think it's because we are the stewards of um, public investments, but that is um, failure. Um, and I say that because um, you know we we really have to show that we are investing um, public dollars well. And so when a project or a partnership or something. Um, you know, isn't working in the way that it's intended. It's it's kind of it's easier for us to try to prop that up than to say, hey, this really isn't working, even though we've made an investment, and we need to move on and do something differently. Um, and so I think I think that that's something that we need to work on as as a public um, public employees, at least several of us up here. Um, but also, um, you know, the, I know the tech industry and um, is 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 good at kind of putting that behind and keeping going and trying new things. And I think that's an area where we could partner. One thing about the framework that I really um, believe in is that it's as much about um, process and the design of. Um, of smart cities work and the evaluation of that work and the interpretation of data and all of those things, um, embedding equity throughout that process as it is, um, it's not dictating outcomes. It's not dictating what the solutions are. So I just, I think that that's really a different approach that the, um, that the city anyway is taking in, in this broader smart cities work across all these different sectors and areas in the city. Great. Thank you, Julie. Well, we are 
Um, close to 1 p.m., we've got two minutes left. I wanted to just, uh, anybody have any closing thoughts about what else you would add to what's already kind of been discussed today about why the technology sector should be focused on equity issues and integrating equity into product and service devel development? Quick closing thoughts. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to say something that um, VEDVE and our partners are really focused on is this idea of benefits and what are the benefits when uh, like creating these technologies and who has access to them. And a lot of times I think people think that when we're talking about benefits, we're just asking to participate in the process or to be able to participate in accessing these technologies. But what we're really moving towards is ideas of, you know, who gets to own these technologies, who gets to own the data that comes out of these technologies, um, and who gets the money. So. With a lot of these new initiatives, there's going to be a lot of wealth building, and we want to make sure that our communities have access to that wealth building. And that's really going to come down to the policies that are enacted and the funding mechanisms that are created to be able to fund these types of initiatives. Sounds great. Um, well, I'd like to uh, join me in thanking all of our panelists for speaking today about a wide range of topic, but really a lot of lessons here I think that we can all take away to make sure that we center and bring equity into all of our work.